Good afternoon, everyone. This is Joanne Stevens, and this is our weekly call-in show. And I, uh, in a moment, I will introduce our guest today, Jim Ayotte, the Executive Director of the Florida Manufactured Home Association. And um, be- before I do that, I want to make uh a few announcements. Number one, if you want to participate in the call or ask a question, simply hit star six, and this call will be recorded, and the uh, uh, points, the highlights will be on our YouTube channel. Also, um, on our July, or I'm sorry, our August newsletter will be coming out soon and it will be posted next week on the website joannemstevens.com so you can get the newsletter there or if you want us to email the newsletter or actually mail it to you we will be happy to do that just uh, either call 319-378-6786 or send me an email Joanne Stevens at iowarealty.com. We'll be happy to um, mail or email the newsletter to you. Also want to remind people that the RV Manufactured Home uh, Hall of Fame dinner is August 7th in Elkhart, Indiana. You can still sign up to attend the awards ceremony. And the George Allen Roundtable event will be held Uh, September 6th, 7th, and 8th in Indianapolis. More information is on the website on how to register and information about these events and other events uh, by going to joannmstevens.com and clicking on Save the Date. Also, one more thing, and then we'll introduce Jim, is um, the Symposium for Mobile Home Park Owners will be December 11th and 12th here in Cedar Rapids, and we will have some appraisers. We're going to have a workshop on maximizing the value of your mobile home park. We're going to have a CPA talk to us about capital gains taxes and 1031 exchanges, and there'll be other uh, speakers too. So uh, without any um, further announcements, I would like to introduce Jim Ayotte. Jim uh, has served on the Manufactured Housing Institute uh, executive team, and after that, he was in 2007, he left the Manufactured Housing Institute to become the Florida Manufactured Housing Executive Director. So he's really dedicated his career to manufactured housing. Uh, Jim is a graduate of the University of Massachusetts, and he has an MBA from Babson uh, College. So we're going to uh, talk today about some of the things that Jim is um, seeing both on the national level and the state level for mobile home parks and communities and, and the sale of mobile homes. Jim, are you with us? Um, push star six to be unmuted. Well, we'll, we'll wait there a moment. I am. For, oh, hi, Jim. Hi, um, Joanne. Sorry about that. I didn't follow the instructions. <laughs> no, no problem. I'm just glad that you could join us. And I was just uh, introducing you to our audience. And I know that you regularly attend, uh, Jim, the uh, manufactured Housing Institute meetings, and the it's been uh, there's been a lot of talk in uh, throughout the industry about the Dodd Frank Act, right. both of the constraints it's put on the industry and that things might be changing. So, can you give us a little um, background on Dodd Frank and what you're what you have um, heard or what's going on in Washington with the Dodd-Frank as it relates to the mobile home business. Sure, sure. You know, the the good news is I think we're seeing some pretty good progress. Uh, And it would be unfortunate if we we weren't able to, I guess, get the ball over the goal line 
um, this year. So we've been working on um, on reforms to the Dodd-Frank Act for the past several years. And we've been successful in getting legislation uh, passed through the um, U.S. House of Representatives a few different on a few different occasions, um, but never being able to, to enact it into law. Um, quite a bit of opposition from the uh, from the previous administration, um, and so it was very difficult to get traction. Uh, this year, a different story, different administration, and uh, they are committed to rolling back regulation, um, and that has been our biggest concern. Uh, you know, we've been trying to work with the uh, the CFPB. Um, and you know, and they understand what the problem is, but they've been reluctant to do anything with it. Um, what we've seen with our industry is we've seen a, a lack of of available lending, especially for low cost homes. Uh, and this has been, you know, really has put in a damper uh, on the industry. Although the industry continues to grow, we are not growing as as quickly as we need to because of constraints with consumer financing. This year. Um, I think MHI is doing a really good job the way that they're approaching um, the uh, financial reform. So we have um, uh, House Resolution 1699, uh, Preserving Access to Manufactured Housing uh, Act. And this legislation does a couple things. Uh, first of all, it will allow lenders um, to um, provide um, homeowners or, or, or to offer um, higher rates and able to recoup their um, their cost of originating a loan. The problem we're running into right now is if a finance company attempts to uh, recoup the cost of originating a loan, um, then they're going to have to charge um, a higher rate for that. And so then they become a high cost loan, which no one wants to be providing high cost loans. There's a huge liability. So this legislation will address that particular our concern that we have and if that gets addressed we feel that there'll be more lending capacity especially for lower value homes lower value in my mind is homes costing less uh, $25,000 or less um, and that's quite frankly that's a that's a large piece of the market the second thing that this legislation done does which is really important for community owners and retailers uh, right now we are constrained through CFPB regulations um, community owners and retailers are not able to work with a customer to help them decide what is the best option for financing their home purchase. Um, and that really stems back from the old days where uh, retailers and community owners were providing financing. They wanted to separate those functions. So they said, retailers and community owners, you can't talk about financing at all. The only thing you can do is provide a list of possible lenders uh, to your customers and send them on their way. It's a terrible way to do business. Um, our customers, many of our customers are not equipped to, to deal with that process. And we're simply, we're simply saying, hey, look at, we're simply selling the home. We're not financing the home. We're not receiving any compensation from any lender for referring business. We wanna be treated just like a real estate agent. We should be able to work with our customers to provide them their best options for securing a loan um, and do so without penalty. And this, the second part of, of the, um, the Preserving Access to Manufactured Housing Act will do that. So good news is those two things are in play. Uh, and what we've seen so far is this uh, in the U.S. House. So in early, uh, actually in May, um, H.R. 1699 was passed by the U.S. House of Representatives. In addition to that, um, there was another um, piece of legislation passed in June by the U.S. House of Representatives called the Financial Choice Act. And this is a much broader piece of legislation, but that legislation also includes the provisions, the manufactured housing provisions in, in um, H.R. 1699. So that has passed the, the House as well. And then we're also approaching this from the appropriations process. And so this just this week, uh, the House uh, Appropriations Committee has approved the provisions in 1699 in the appropriations package um, that will be uh, entertained by the House. So I think we have all our bases covered in the House. Uh, and hopefully, if we continue to work to get sponsorships, uh, in both the House and the Senate, we'll keep the pressure on. And we're anticipating that sooner or later, that financial reform will be uh, come to the forefront um, in the Senate. And from there, we hopefully we can get this done. Uh, we're confident that if we do, that the 
this legislation will be signed into law. Well, Jim, that is a, um, a tremendous update and a very um, optimistic and much needed and uh, it's a revelation <laughs> that uh, the things you said about what's in, in the works, I mean, that would be a huge benefit to the manufacturers, the mobile home park owners, right. the retailers, um, and especially the consumers. I mean, the consumer is the, um, a huge beneficiary of this. No, absolutely. You know, and that's been one of the biggest problems that we've seen here in Florida as well, is that because of the lack of financing, you know, the, the buyer really is king in this market. So what is happening because there's no financing out there, um, the, the price of lower cost homes are being driven down even further, which is really unfortunate. Um, and so by getting more liquidity uh, into the lower end market, I think it's going to stabilize the market. I think it's going to make um, our products a lot more attractive uh, going forward. So, you know, I, I'm optimistic that we can get this done. I mean, you know, quite frankly, if we can't get this done with the current, re the current Republican controlled Congress in the current Republican administration, um, something something's wrong with that. So, you know, the, the good news is we never hear about it. All we hear about is all the crazy things going on uh, in Washington. But this uh, financial reform is moving forward. It's somewhat quiet. It's not making front page headlines, but it is making progress. And I'm really confident that, um, you know, by the end of the year, uh, this thing hopefully will be done. Well, that's, um, yeah, we want to definitely keep in touch with you, Jim. I know you're really following this because Florida is a, does a huge amount of uh, retail sales in addition to having, men, you know, probably one of the largest, the highest number of communities and parks in the U.S. So it's a huge thing for every state, but especially for Florida. And Jim, I thought, I wanted to ask you about uh, the, uh, would you tell our listeners what the CFPB is? Yes, this is the this is the federal agency that regulates um, all financing in the company. So in the country, so you know all banking activity, Wall Street, everything else, you know, is regulated by the uh, CFPB, which is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, and, and that whole thing has been a mess to start with. It was set up under the Obama administration, but the CFPB is totally independent. There's no oversight. And so they can really do what they want. So, you know, we go to Congress and we lay out what our concerns are. And they said, you're right. You know, as an industry, you have some legitimate concerns, but they don't really have any control or sway over CFPB. So it's very difficult um, to get the CFPB to back away on, on their regulations. So the CFPB has been um, extremely liberal um, and they really have looked, at, have, have looked at business with a jaded eye. Um, they feel that, hey, our job is to protect consumers and we really don't care what happens with business. And quite frankly, that's not a regulator's job. A regulator's job is to balance the interest of both consumers and business. You can't take up, you can't look at it from one perspective um, you know, and, and go forward with that. That's just not, not healthy, and it's just not right. No, it's not. And I'll give you a perfect example of what you just said, a true-to-life example. And um, I think any retailer uh, would attest to this, but you're in the 1990s when there was consumer financing to buy new and used mobile homes, and it was uh, widely available, and you know it wasn't perfect financing, but at least it was available uh, it, for uh, consumers that owned a mobile home. They were able to actually easily sell that mobile home, and sometimes at um, increased prices. I mean, right. the, kind of the conventional wisdom to say as well: if you own a mobile home, the value of it di starts diminishing the day you take possession of that home, like a like a car. But when there is consumer financing available, those um, and assuming that the local economy is relatively uh, stable and right. uh, that that homeowner, that mobile homeowner has uh, quite you know, a good chance that that home is actually going to appreciate in value because the buyer of that home is going to be able to obtain financing. Right, right. You know, and, and we are seeing that now in some pockets of Florida, um, you know, um, real estate has really heated up again. 
um, you know, in, in many areas of the country, especially in Florida. So we are mm-hmm. seeing, um, you know, good appreciation rates of homes located in land lease communities. Um, but I tell you what, those homes tend to be higher value because when you get to the lower value homes, uh, mm-hmm. because there's no financing, um, they're not realizing the appreciation that they they should or could, uh, and in many in many situations, um, you know you know people are going in there and buying those homes, um, you know at a fire sale, you know mm-hmm. simply because the buyer wants to sell, um, and there's a very limited pool of of buyers out there with cash. That's correct. You pretty much have to be a cash buyer, and and the real detriment to the the homeowner of that mobile home is when they desire to sell for. Um, and need to move, and oftentimes it is because of employment. You know, in other yep. words, if their uh, company closes or they lose their job for whatever reason, many times they do. Um, it's to their benefit to be able to move to another market, whether it's another state or another city, uh, for employment. But they're right. pretty much stuck unless they simply abandon their home, and and that's. Um, easy for us to, you know, talk about, but it's very detrimental to anybody to have to just give up the ownership of their home and right. have that on their, on their right. record. It's a tremendous, uh, certainly doesn't benefit them. And so it sounds like what we're saying is that when the CFPB made these regulations, they didn't really think it through of how the homeowner is uh, ultimately impacted by this. No, they really didn't. And, and you know, the, the the sad truth is this: uh, you know, they they threw chattel lending uh, into the same bucket as real property lending, and it is different, you know. And for some reason, we were not able to properly, I guess, communicate, you know, what the differences were. So we kind of got lumped in there. And ever right. since then, we've been trying to fight our way out of it, which has been which has been real frustrating. So as I said, um, 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 hopefully this will get done this year because I think as an industry, we have been so focused on financial reform over the past several years that it really has you know, prohibited us as an industry from doing other things which are critically important. I mean, I, I look at where we are right now and say, you know, the economy is, go- is going strong. You know, what do we need to do as an industry you know, to continue to grow. And when you start thinking about that, that's, that's a little bit frightening because, we, you know, when you look back to the, you know, to the, to the Great Recession, uh, we saw a lot of vacancies in a lot of communities. People were walking away from their homes. They couldn't afford it. There was no financing out there. And right now, the industry, and it has been for the past couple of years, the industry has been booming. We are filling all kinds of vacant sites uh, in Florida, which is, which is great news. Um, but on the other hand, when I start looking out, you know, to the horizon, I'm a little bit concerned because a couple things are happening. So we're filling, we're filling vacant sites. Our manufacturers are thrilled. All our manufacturers are out 10 to 12 weeks in production. I mean, uh, customers are angry now, retailers and community owners, because they can't get homes fast enough. But after all those vacant sites um, get completed, um, What's going to happen after that? We're not seeing very much new construction going on with uh, new land lease communities in Florida. Uh, And so my concern is, you know, if we don't do something as an industry uh, to really promote ourselves and to generate more interest, we're going to end up becoming a a replacement market in our community business. Um, And that's not a good place to be. Uh, we, We offer such value that we need to find a way to expand our market to areas where where we haven't reached before. And I think that's really going to be the challenge as we, as we look to the future is how we, how are we going to grow the industry? Is it going to be in communities? Does it make sense? You know, do do the economics make sense today to build a land lease community? Um, We're not seeing very many of them done. Uh, You know, I've been told by several people, Hey, you know, back, 30 years ago, it made sense to build a land lease community. Today, it doesn't really make sense to build it from scratch. You know, there's a, there's, it takes a long time to, to build it out and to sell all those homes in there. And so we're seeing a lot of communities being bought and sold, but very few uh, developed. So we really need to figure out, okay, so how do we grow as an industry? We have such a great value proposition. We're building homes today that, that are better than ever. Um, we need to find a way to educate more people 
you know, and to find ways to, to grow our industry, both, you know, land lease, um, subdivisions, and also on private property. Yes, I think that's a really good point because um, I'm not all that familiar with the um, prices that uh, investors are paying for properties in Florida, although I've heard it's quite an expensive market to buy a park in. And certainly in the Midwest, the prices being paid for parks is approaching or in many cases surpassed the cost of developing a site. So what I'm saying is for what you're right. paying to buy a park, you could, um, that's about what it costs, or even a, um, a, little, a little bit less to actually build the park. The wild right. card is, um, you know, you have to, the time involved in, in filling the sites. Exactly. One difference though is that today it is much more common for community owners, park owners to, uh, which have become the retailers here, here in the Midwest, uh, for sure. I don't know if it's that way in Florida. Or the, same, yeah, same in Florida. Yeah. So we're seeing, um, because of the constraints in the f consumer financing, more park owners are renting the homes, doing rent-to-owns, lease with an option to purchase, uh, all of that type of financing. And so that's become, I would say, mainstream. So that is, uh, it changes the owner, the the operations part of it because you're renting the homes in addition to renting the sites. Right, but right. it is um, different than it was in the 1990s when it was considered pretty taboo to rent the homes. Right, and and that has been a that has been a, a growth part of the market here as well. Uh, in in Florida, is uh, you know lease option is, is become quite big. We have a number of finance companies that will. Basically, if a community owner is interested in, in financing the home themselves, mm -hmm. um, they'll do all the compliance work to make sure okay. you know that the loan is legal. Uh, so there's different options around there. But what happens is when you start tying up your capital um, in renting homes versus selling homes, you know, yes. or financing homes where you otherwise wouldn't do that, um, then you have less capacity, you know, to invest in the community. Um, you know, or expand the community, which, that's, you know, is, is not a good thing point. as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, it just all of a sudden takes, aside from being costing, say, 35000 to build the site, yep. to probably now you have a $100,000 per site at least uh, yep. cost because you're buying the home and so forth. And so it does require tremendous amount of bandwidth or bringing in partners and, it just really does change the game without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, you know it, it does, and, and and those are some of the issues I think we really need to look at as a as an industry, um, because you know times have changed, and so you know again, you know you know what's the model? How are we going to grow the industry? Um, you know, I, again, I look at what our manufacturers are doing, and more importantly, what our manufacturers are capable of doing, um, and there's just no question in my mind. You know, that again, you know, manufactured housing, you know, could be such a larger piece of the total single family housing market in this country, you know, but we, we but we really need to understand what the market is and then, you know, what to build, how to build it, how to go to market, you know, to increase that. And uh, I know there's been some talk about that at the, at the national level. I know some of our, our manufacturers are, are talking about, you know, maybe a different type of manufactured home that's... Um, you know, more conducive to private lot setting, you know, more, you know, more Cape Cod looking and, and, um, you know, more conventional looking than our, than our current manufactured homes. Um, I think that would be great because the, the capacity is there. Um, but we just have to figure out, okay, so how do we go about doing that? You know, what are the regulatory requirements? What are the transportation requirements? And how do we go to market to reach the audience that are interested in buying those homes? Well, that that's a very good point, and but let me ask you, Jim, both uh, from because you are involved with the retailers, the manufacturers, and the community owners. Do you think uh, what um, do you think that the park owners, manufacturers, and retailers are really stating the case as 
articulately enough that the consumer understands all the features and benefits they're getting with when they buy a mobile home or a manufactured home, whether it's a used home or a new home? No, I, I, you know, I, I don't think they are. I don't think we ever have. And I think that has been one of the biggest Achilles heels of the industry. I think we, we have consistently have done a below average job communicating the value proposition. Um, and it's, and it's frustrating. Um, you know, one thing that we're, we're doing in Florida, which I'm really excited about is we have made the commitment that we are going to put together a, um, a, a, an education marketing campaign in Florida that will hopefully become the model for the rest of the country. Um, we understand that we need to reach a broader audience and we need to talk to them specifically about what the value proposition is. And, you know, we spent some time and we, we just finished doing a, a research project. Um, the Manufactured Housing Institute was doing a national consumer research project. Uh, we decided to dovetail on that in Florida and we just got the results back as well. And what we're basically looking for is just is to find out what people what people know about manufactured housing and, and what they and how they perceive manufactured housing and what they are looking for in housing. Now we have some of those raw results, and we're going to actually turn that into a into a a large uh, education marketing program um, to get, to get out there. So I mean we're looking forward just to educating more people. Uh, both in Florida and throughout the country, about the benefits of not only manufactured housing but manufactured housing land lease communities. And uh, you know, uh, while we've done a you know a, a poor job with manufactured housing as a whole, I think we even have done a you know a a a poorer job with the value proposition of land lease communities. I mean, it's an, it's an amazing value proposition when you look at it. I mean, you know, here in Florida, you know, for an example. You know, we're fairly well regulated when it comes to community. And so anyone that comes in to rent a, a site in our community, we provide them with a prospectus and we let them know how their rent will be will be increased over the length of their tenancy. So theoretically, someone can come in, they will know what the rent is and they will know on what factors that, that, that it will be increased by. So it could be CPI or CPI plus a certain factor and certain mm -hmm. pass-throughs and all. That's incredible good information in, in what sure. a value proposition, especially for retirees. Imagine if you came in here and say, oh, so my rent's going to be X to start, and I know it can only go up by X plus on a monthly basis. I can schedule out what I'm going to be paying over the next 10 or 15 years. You know, So I That's know exactly. That's a huge benefit. Huge benefit. And we don't do that. And, and so what happens is someone comes in, you know, and it's a lot less money out of pocket because they're not buying land. You know, they're leasing land over time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great value proposition, you know, with, with a lot of, of, of benefits that we really haven't done a good job of, of communicating. So that's going to be part of our strategy as well is to, is to educate people on the value proposition, you know, of leasing land versus buying land. You mm -hmm. know, and all the amenities that they can get through a community. So, I mean, I'm really excited because we've talked about this as an industry forever. I mean, I've been around now for 25 years. And for the past 25 years, we talked about the need to go out to the general public, you know, with an, with an industry education program or industry image building campaign. And we have never, we have never done that. And I think we now never that done the that. industry is stronger, we have the ability to do that in Florida. And, uh, and I'm excited about it. I mean, we are committed to, um, you know, to spending the money that we need, you know, in order to get the message out there. And we will make sure that we measure exactly what we're doing, you know, to ensure, you know, that, that we're getting a payback from our investment. You know, I think um, I will second the motion of what you said. This we've been trying as an industry to communicate with the consumers uh, and also, you know, cities and towns and, uh, you know, other people about the image and the tremendous value that mobile homes and mobile home park living offer the, the, um, the you know, towns and cities and the consumers. And maybe the time is better now than it was, say, in the 1990s. And the reason I say that is because, you know, many industries, just like many um, ethnicities, uh, when they come to the U.S., uh, it takes a while to get 
assimilated. And right. when we think about it, you know, manufactured housing and mobile homes have only been around since, um, you know, really as mobile home parks in the 1950s. I mean, I'm sure there's, right. and, and most of them, even in the 1960s. So even though that's over 50 years or 60 years, it's not in the scope of housing, it's not that long of a time. Right. And we do have the millennial generation who maybe doesn't have as many preconceived ideas about mobile home parks. So the timing could be maybe a little better. Well, you know, and that's exactly it. Because if you look, you know, and if you start looking at, you know, the, the older generation, you know, um, the retiree market now, and that's even getting better. We, we've always thought as an industry, you know, just people have a bad perception of, of mobile homes, manufactured housing. They just don't, they have a bad perception. They have a, they have a faulty perception of us. But then you start looking now at the new generation, the millennials, you know, and uh, even some of the boomers. The problem is they don't have a bad perception. They just don't know about us. You know, so we have the ability to, to basically frame the argument, frame the value proposition to them. You know, and if we do that right, if we do it consistently, uh, I'm convinced that we'll get a lot more people excited and energized in, in being advocates of, of manufactured housing. Um, we just we just really haven't haven't done that. And um, and I think, you know, that I think the time, you know, probably the time is the time is definitely right now. But, you know, that I think we should should have been doing this for a long time. You know, when I look at the national basis, uh, the national level, I think we did have an opportunity back maybe in the early 90s to have done a, a national image building campaign like um, like the Go RVing campaign. Yes, but, yes. But what we've seen at that time is we've seen massive consolidation in the manufacturing segment. So at this point, I mean, you have what you know, you know the the the, the three you know big C's. I mean, you know, Clayton, Cavco, and Champion. Um, they have you know the vast majority of the market share. Um, I don't see, you know, I think that we've seen so much consolidation. There's probably not a great deal of interest, you know, to go out and to promote the industry on a unified fashion. I think those companies can go out on their own, and I think they can make hay and increase their individual market share. So that's probably their motivation versus trying to lift the whole industry. So I think we need to look at um, at trade associations, whether it be the Manufactured Housing Institute or um, other state associations to, to pick up that challenge and say, hey, look, it, we're going to go out there and, and we're going to educate people, and uh, you know we're going to you know we're going to uh, reach them and, and teach them the value proposition of our industry, and hopefully get them engaged. And I think it's going to be a domino effect when, when that happens. When more people look at our industry, understand it, appreciate it, um, that's going to help us with local government and everything else. I mean, I think the whole, I think it's going to be a snowball effect. The, the, the need for affordable housing in this country has never been greater. Um, and so I think if we, if we present the right, the right story, the right, the right value, um, I really do think that we're going to pick up some traction. And I really do believe that the industry will, will, will grow a lot quicker than it has um, over the past you know, couple decades. Jim, I think that those are really valid points, and we're getting towards the end of our um, the end of our show. And so I wanted to um, to ask you a question about uh, zoning. Uh, but before I do, I wanted to just tell you as you were speaking about the you know what's different now than the 1990s and about the millennials. Uh, my assistant, uh, Kristen, is a millennial, and she was sitting here nodding her head to every <laughs> everything that you said. And uh, so somehow we do have to figure that piece of it out. But uh, let me ask you, both you and I have had our uh, trials and tribulations with um, local zoning for new mobile home parks and new communities. Yes. And and you also just said, or I heard you say that the need for affordable housing has never been uh, greater, and I think study after study after study has said pretty much the same thing. So do you think that there is a better understanding by municipalities that uh, affordable, that mobile home parks really do fill a need in, uh, um, in cities today or towns? Well, I, I think, 
I think that there there could be. And let me explain. I, I Again, I don't think we have done a real good job working with local government. In fact, I know when I look at retailers sometimes that are placing homes, one-off homes um, in, in municipalities, um, I get very frustrated sometimes because a lot of times a retailer is interested in selling a home and they're not really concerned about what the impact is on the neighborhood. And to me, I mean, I, almost every day I, I spend some time dealing with those problems, you know, and I scratch my head and I look at the retailer and I say, what are you doing? I mean, if you would only do this right, if you would yes. only bring a home in yes. that was compatible with the other housing in that neighborhood, you yes. could own that neighborhood. You could sell five or six homes, but what you're doing is you're selling one home and then you're calling me up and then we get involved in a battle. You know, yes. we usually win because rights on our side, you know, but I tell you what, we've caused so many problems in, 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 at the end of the day, I mean, we're one and done because local government finds a way to keep us out going forward. So I think that's that's an issue that we need to address with communities. You know, I think it, and, and I'm fortunate being here in Florida because we have say, uh, seven manufacturing uh, plants here in Florida. Mm -hmm. I was dealing with an issue down in the uh, the Tampa Clearwater area last month, and mm -hmm. the county wanted to start offering incentives to close older mobile home parks and mm. they wanted them to be redeveloped with anything but a manufactured housing community they said no we don't want that you can put a modular home in do a modular subdivision but no more mobile home parks um, went down grabbed the city commissioners um, I mean grabbed the county commissioners brought them to a manufactured housing plan you know after 45 minutes, they were blown away. They said, this is oh, incredible. Heaven, I never yeah. realized you guys did this. I tell you, they looked at me and said, so tell me, how can we help you as an industry? So we went back in. We rewrote the ordinance the way we wanted it. In fact, it was just heard this Tuesday night and approved by the Board of County Commissioners in their first hearing. Um, those are the things that we can do. If, if we do it right and, 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 and grab these elected officials at the local level and, and show them what we can do, we can convince them that they should be granting uh, permits for new manufactured housing communities. But they need to be able to go in and, and they need to be able to touch the product and feel the product yeah. and go into nice communities. When they do that, we can sell them. But to try to communicate, you know, by sending them pretty pictures and, and, and you know, laying out in paper what you, what you want to do, that yeah. doesn't fly. That, just, that doesn't work anymore. That's, um, uh, you know, so many, uh, uh, zoning proposals failed and that's the reason you know the developers would spend time and money and resources you know doing the renderings and putting it all down on paper but they you know unless you can touch it see it smell it um, it just doesn't uh, no, it doesn't no. make sense they don't go for it so um, well I think that Jim I think that is just a phenomenal success and uh, you deserve all the credit in the world for thinking how, of how to get that zoning uh, approved. I mean, that is a game changer. I, I think that that, is, uh, that could be a case study for other cities who, um, I know here in the Midwest, there have been uh, cities who have closed or want to close or are trying to close older parks. Like, and they like, just don't understand it. They think there's a higher and better use that will bring in more tax dollars. For, and there probably isn't because the re, uh, retail real estate and office real estate has, uh, th that game is changing too. It and, is, it is. Um, but uh, um, people on the city council don't necessarily understand that. And, no, um, it, it, and it's a little bit more difficult in the Midwest as well because you know I worked in Ohio for several years, right? And you know, and and you don't have manufacturing plants close by all the time. I mean, it's right. Florida, it's easy because you know we're you know we're a large market, so we have plants throughout the state, so it's it's easily to get you know bureaucrats and regulators there. I mean, I have mm -hmm. never once in my life taken any politician or um, administrative official through a plant that, that weren't blown away by it, you mm -hmm, know, but mm -hmm. sometimes it makes it really difficult. You know, if anyone called me and said, I want to develop a community, how would I go about doing it? I would say, grab local government officials, you know, put them on a bus, put them on a plane, do whatever, 
get yeah. them to a manufactured housing yes. plant because when you do that, you know, you will win them over. If you yes. don't do that, they're never really going to quite understand what you're talking about. And yes. it's going to make your job a lot more difficult to get the approvals that you need. Yeah. So we're, we have one minute left, and I want to use that one minute to thank Jim. Uh, I, the ideas that you have presented, the information you've um, presented today, Jim, has just been fantastic and uh, of great benefit to our listeners. So um, I want to keep in touch with you on this zoning and Absolutely. you know your ideas because I think this is you're on the forefront of the new zoning movement for more parks in in the United States. So thank you very much, and we'll look forward to catching up with you at a next the next MHI event. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Joanne, and okay. thank you for, for having this forum as well. My pleasure. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jim.